we're not talking about bears that are going to raid their kitchen. We're talking about a lion that comes to your bedroom and eats you. Let's start what we have come into the room to do. To me, one of the great success stories of conservation that we don't hear much about in this country is what's happened in South Africa in the last 25 years or so. In the early 1900s, the South African settlers basically depopulated the whole country of its wildlife. A lot of South African species went extinct at that point, and others had their ranges drastically reduced. But in the last 20 years, those numbers have come back. And it's been because of the development of private conservancies who have taken run-down cattle ranches that were not profitable anymore, and they put wild game on them. And so, oh, the animals can thrive here, the wildebeest, the impala, they're back, great. How are they going to make money off of it? Well, then they turn them back into big five destinations. So they would bring back elephants, they'd bring back rhino, they'd bring back lions. So if we look at really big, dangerous animals, uh, there are so many forces working against them because the available land for them is shrinking. Uh, the challenges that they face, should they ever leave one of these protected areas, are becoming overwhelming, uh, that it's almost to the point where we're going to have maybe two different types of protected area. We're hearing so many calls for coexistence, for somehow uh, not having separation with wildlife, not having separation from nature. And I think those calls make sense if you're talking about hummingbirds and butterflies. That, sure, it's great to be sitting in a field and seeing little things trickle by. But it's not so great when the animal that comes by can eat you or trample you. And that's not the feeling that people are conjuring when they're thinking this up. So there may be large parts of the world that there are no big dangerous species. And there may be many areas where it's those non-dangerous species you really want to give priority to. In those cases, I think the model of having people be more mindful of their impact on the environment, of ways that they can reduce their impacts around them, and have a more proactive attitude will definitely be a good thing. But where you have animals that are so inherently dangerous as a lion, or a tiger, or an elephant, I think that's immoral. Because I don't think there's an acceptable level of murder, <laughs> which it almost is, mm -hmm. to say that people should continue to live in proximity to an animal that can kill them so easily. So in those cases, I think we really have to recognize that there will need to be a lot more barriers that do physically protect us from those animals, but keeping in mind that those same barriers are perhaps the best protection for those animals against us. And these areas are huge. The Kruger's the size of New Jersey. Now, in areas that big, natural processes take place. Those animals barely know there's a fence because so many of those animals live so far away from the fence it really doesn't matter. If the fence wasn't there, they'd be right next to orange orchards, they'd be next to pineapple fields, they wouldn't be able to go out there anyway. There's already a boundary. The only reason for those animals to leave that park is to go out and cause trouble, to kill livestock, to eat people, to wreck crops. And the people who then live outside don't want that. And so we know there's a lot of retaliatory killing, there's a lot of resentment against the wildlife. Uh, we see that in the U.S. with wolves that leave Yellowstone and they get into the way of the ranchers. Now, in these areas in Africa where you have these big, dangerous species, and you have this very high rural population, a barrier breaks that conflict. How are you going to bring back lions to an area that hasn't had any for 100 years? You've got all these people wandering around like they would in our neighborhoods. Oh, yeah, we're going to have lions again. Well, the first thing you do is you build a fence. And your reserve may be 300 square kilometers, and maybe 125 square kilometers. It's not huge, but it's not bad. And that's native habitat. 
you put a fence around it, and the first thing they do is they go around to all the local communities. They say, look, here's our fence. You'll be safe. Can we bring lions back? And people say, yes. Safety first for people, then bring the wildlife, and it's spread. There's more lions in South Africa today than there were 100 years ago. The opposition to these barriers, I find, often reflect not just a naive unawareness, a lack of awareness of the danger they pose to people, but somehow the view that, well, we have so much of the world that's safely protected, like there's supposed to be some percentage of the planet that's a protected area, yeah. a national park or a reserve of some sort. And so we could add to that. We could make more. And the tragedy there is that those protected areas are only protected in theory, not in practice. My experience is in Africa. There are dozens of countries in Africa, and most countries in Africa are too poor to look after these reserves. Tourist revenues are too low to support what's required to protect the animals in those reserves. To me, the most important challenge going forward for conservation in Africa is not some of these lesser problems of people's attitudes towards day-to-day -day exposure to these animals, it's towards people's attitudes of, how are we going to pay for this? At Independence, in the 1960s, all the former colonies of the British and the French, Portuguese, etc., they were left behind in these countries, large game reserves, large national parks. And at Independence, they were told, we've left you with these fabulous reserves, but the wildlife must pay its own way. And we've all bought into that paradigm ever since, that for Africa, wildlife must pay its own way. That gate receipts, entrance fees, trophy fees, whatever, it gives value to wildlife, so therefore the local people will agree to leave this land aside for nature rather than for their own use. Well, we've had over 50 years to see how this is working out, and the evidence is really clear it doesn't work. For most of Africa, the revenue being generated is far less than what's needed to give protection to these precious areas. And I think this is where we need to start talking to ourselves and saying, well, it's the West, it's the intelligentsia, it's the educated strata of society that says, oh my God, we really want to have these places. Well, we have to pay for it. And we can't just pay for it when we show up in our Land Rover or when we're looking down the sights of our gun we have to pay for it every day. So I like to think about it like this, that in the West, we have a number of beautifully protected areas. We have Yellowstone, we have Yosemite, we have beautiful parks in Europe, beautiful parks in Australia. And if you look to see how those parks are supported, it's not by entrance fees. It's not by giving value to wildlife. Nobody's saying how much the giant granite domes in Yosemite are worth. That's not how it's done. We recognize that as int intrinsic to our perception as a nation that Yosemite is one of our great resources. So we pay for it out of our taxes. I think the same way about Serengeti. I think the same way like that about Kruger Park. There are a number of places in Africa that to me are just as important as our American parks.